Chapter 7 Smothered London had been reeking in a green-yellow fog. Winston Churchill, A Traveller in Wartime, 1918 The weather was so different today, Wednesday, December 10th, the day after the fog blew away. It was warmer now, close to 50 degrees, and stormy. There were strong winds from the south that sucked up the rain and spewed it across the city, showers that pelted from above and every side. If the gusts had arrived just a few days earlier, they might have quickly whisked away the smog so it would have had no chance to strengthen, to spread, and to kill. Wednesday's blustery weather was a bit jarring, as if each gust carried some mischief looking for a place to settle. Ethel Christie sat down to pen that letter to her sister Lily on the tablet she frequently used to write to family. She carefully wrote her return address, 10 Rillington Place, on the top right corner of the first page. Her next pen strokes were important, so crucial that they would be mentioned in court one day. She pressed the black ink gently into the grey stationery to mark the date, December 10th, 1952. Then she began to write. I have not heard from you since I wrote to you in November, Ethel said. She fretted over an aunt who had not returned her notes. She asked Lily to visit the elderly woman to make sure she was safe. Then Ethel began complaining about their upstairs neighbours and the fog. I wish we could get out of here, Ethel griped. It is awful with these people here. How are you getting on now the winter has arrived? It was really dreadful here at the weekend with the fog and made us feel quite ill, but it is better today. Ethel never mentioned Reggie's resignation, and she didn't disclose that they would be forced to ask for money from the unemployment exchange, two important events she would have certainly mentioned to her sister. Ethel was clearly oblivious, but Reggie's colleagues at the British Road Services knew he was now unemployed. Ethel finished the letter, but she decided against posting it just yet. She frequently abandoned notes on the pad for days before finishing them and there was a stack of beautiful Christmas cards that still needed attention. Ethel left the tablet on the table, went about her day. She was so naive and vulnerable, she trusted Reg implicitly, despite his alarming past. John Reginald Halliday Christie was born on April 8, 1899, near Halifax in northern England, in what he described as a large dark house which still stands on a bleak Yorkshire moor. He was raised with five sisters and a brother in a strict working-class Victorian household. He considered his mother, Mary Hannah Christie, to be extraordinarily kind and loving. His father, Ernest Christie, was a strict taskmaster who drank little but leveled a frightening punishment if he felt it was warranted. His son recalled his horrible temper and how his mother had tried in vain to protect the children. I always lived in dread of my father, Reg recalled. He was stern, strict, and proud. Ernest Christie insisted the children march with him to their Anglican church every Sunday, embarking on a five-mile trek, wearing their formal dress. We had to hold our shoulders back, swing our arms, and walk like guardsmen, said Reg. Ernest worked in a factory where he was well respected, especially for his aptitude in medicine and first aid, a trait that Reg aspired to later in life. But as much as he respected his father, he continued to fear him. Reg remembered a day when Ernest suspected him of stealing tomatoes, which the boy hated, and hit him. When his mother finally convinced Ernest that their son was innocent, Reg received a shilling as an apology. As he aged, Reg settled into normal schoolboy activities. He became a boy scout and later an assistant scoutmaster. He sang with his church choir and excelled at sports and academics, particularly mathematics. He tinkered with mechanical things like clocks. He loved photography, but Reg was always a nervous, awkward person, even as a child. He was scared of the dark, and as an adult, he was still easily spooked at night. He awoke frequently from bad dreams. And, most disturbingly, Reg had always been absolutely entranced by dead bodies. When I was eight, I saw my first corpse. It was my grandfather, said Reg. You would expect that for a little boy this would be a terrible experience. For me it was not. I was not frightened, worried, or perturbed in the slightest. 
I looked at the corpse with a strange, pleasant thrill. That image of his grandfather lying stiff on a table in the family's parlour was beguiling for the young boy and foretelling. As he grew older, his social awkwardness hindered his relationships, especially with women, until he met Ethel Simpson. It was a short courtship of just a few months, but Reg and Ethel wed on May 10th, 1920, at a government office in Halifax. She was twenty-two and quite attractive. He was twenty-one and still painfully shy. Their union might have given him a sense of stability, but it also prompted some devious behavior that would follow him for decades. The Halifax Post Office hired him the year after the Christies married, but his supervisors quickly fired him after he was caught stealing postal orders. Reg spent three months in prison. Ethel remained with him, but soon there were more troubling accusations. In 1923, after just three years of marriage, Reg left Ethel in Halifax and moved to London. He claimed she was drinking heavily and having an affair with her boss at an engineering company. The following year, Reg was convicted again of stealing, this time a bike, money and cigarettes. He spent eight months doing hard labour. In 1929, Reg was staying with a married mother named Maud Cole, along with her young son in a Battersea flat. He was living off her income, and when she pressured him to find employment, Reg became incensed, hit her on the back of the head with a wooden cricket bat, then pushed her out the door. It half stunned me. It was all the world like an explosion, said Cole. Everything seemed to go black for a second. She was left with a five-inch gash in her head. Reg claimed it had been an accident. He was just taking a practice swing. But the judge believed it to be attempted murder, and Reg spent five months in prison with hard labor. He couldn't seem to stay straight. In 1933, Reg was convicted of stealing a car and served three months in Wandsworth Prison. After more than ten years apart, Ethel came to see him. As he sat across from her, dressed in prison clothes, her intentions seemed more pragmatic than romantic. At the visit, she said it was a question of divorce or coming together again. I asked her which she preferred, and she said, coming together again, Reg recalled. After a couple of weeks, we felt as if we had never been parted. This time, Ethel seemed to be a steadying influence on Reg's troubled life. He worked as an electrician, a lorry driver, a dispatch clerk. His longest employment was as a war reserve policeman during World War II, which was his post for four years until 1943. They had no children, though both claimed they hoped for some. Reg even mentioned that Ethel had volunteered to adopt little Geraldine Evans if Beryl ever walked away from the family. But they never became parents except for two loyal pets. Since he was a child, Reg had adored animals, so the couple owned a young black cat that stalked birds in the back garden. And there was also that dog, the old brown Irish terrier that was blind in one eye, the one who liked to dig in his garden. Humans never seemed to understand me quite, but animals always did, Reg said. His dog was fifteen years old, and Reg cared for her as a puppy. So this was the Christie family. Reg, Ethel, a cat, and a dog, together for years. My wife and I were really happy together. Just the two of us, and the animals, said Reg. We were contented. Neighbors found Reg to be an exceptionally quirky man, but they had no idea of the contradictory nature of his public and private lives. They knew he was consumed with his camera and constantly flanked by his dog. He was an amateur photographer who occasionally snapped photos of street parties, Ethel, and, apparently, prostitutes. He was also a teetotaler who bristled at the implication that he ever visited public houses for a pint. He preferred tea. Yet witnesses said he chatted up women at pubs with a beer in hand. He supported the Queen's Park Rangers, the same football team that Timothy Evans gushed over during his long train ride with the police from Wales to London. The Christies were not especially social. Reg didn't seem to have many friends. Ethel was close with her family, but Reg let fifteen years pass without speaking to any of his siblings. The couple had only each other. One neighbour recalled that Reg was a very polite man who never talks to anyone very much. 
He generally kept to himself, so people labelled him as either affable or aloof. I am a quiet, humble man who hates rows or trouble, explained Reg. I love animals. I am fond of children. I come from a solid, respectable, old-fashioned type of Yorkshire family. And so, that Wednesday, Ethel's afternoon continued on, and her letter lay there, unassuming and undisturbed for days, until Reg noticed it, picked it up, and made a small change. Two days after the end of the fog, the Ministry of Health needed information and data, very quickly. The press may not yet have realised that the city was in the middle of a health crisis, but medical experts knew. They needed to get ahead of the story before the media had an opportunity to alarm the public. So health officials began making phone calls to medical officers, coroners and pathologists in more than two dozen boroughs across Greater London. How many patients died over those five days, they asked. What were the causes? Were they fog-related? The responses arrived within days. Some just included the requested data. Others also gave anecdotal evidence and personal stories. Lewisham in south-east London, where Rosemary Sargent went to school, had one of the highest mortality rates during the fog. My pathologists report that the great majority of these cases turned out to be deaths of elderly people from cardiac failure supervening on well-established emphysema and bronchitis wrote Dr. William Heddy, the area's coroner. The rush of cases occurred very suddenly. A physician in Kensington explained that he was called to the homes of twelve very healthy, active patients. They all had bronchial spasms, along with ronchi, low-pitched, rattling lung sounds that often resembled snoring. There was also wheezing. The medical officer of health for Walthamstow explained that during the fog there were about 700 sickness claims, three times the normal number. The medical officer of health for Stepney disclosed that his borough's deaths had quadrupled. The total deaths of all ages for Stepney during recent normal weeks was 25, wrote Dr. F. R. O'Sheel. The total deaths of all ages in fog week was 83. The medical officer of health for Wandsworth pulled his death records for those patients who had had a post-mortem exam. Two experienced investigators found 17 possible fog-related deaths, but it was difficult to declare a definitive cause. The medical officer suggested that the investigators eliminate other factors. They were instructed to look into the question of any possible infectious conditions in the household, including upper respiratory infections, chronic ears, etc., wrote Dr. Tudor Lewis. As you will see, the findings seem to be consistently negative. The fog was clearly to blame. Within a week, the Ministry of Health wrote Dr. Lewis back, thanking him for his data on the 17 fog deaths. That's how health officials began describing the victims. Fog deaths? I have no doubt about it whatsoever, wrote Dr. Lewis Beckel, the coroner from Romford in South Woodford, Essex, northeast of London. There was a sudden, spectacular increase in cardiorespiratory deaths, which, although normally high at this time of the year, was far and away above anything I had previously experienced and must be attributed to the fog, with the assistance of the coal board's well-advertised nutty slack. Dr. Beckel was furious. The fog had sickened him too. He couldn't move for four days without pain from bronchial spasms, and he suspected that the government's aggressive campaign of selling ration-free, dirty brown coal had made the fog even deadlier. This fog was a killer and wiped out a great number of people who would have otherwise survived with their chronic bronchitis and emphysema, damaged hearts, etc., wrote Dr. Beckel. What are our wonderful scientists doing? In an age of jet propulsion, atomic energy, these wretched people can't solve the problem of a lousy fog. Each medical officer of health seemed to struggle with how to determine what a fog death would be. What if the patient was already sick? Most were already suffering from an illness, a respiratory problem, or a heart issue. What if no others in the household appeared sickened by the smoke? The investigation became so murky. Some medical officers also included lists of specific victims. In Battersea, 69-year-old Andrew Kingwell died of chronic bronchitis and emphysema. 
He had trouble breathing that Sunday night and then died in his sleep the next day. Eighty-year-old Edward Jones battled a cold for several days. On the first day of the fog he ventured outside, and when he returned home he refused to rest in bed despite a horrible cough. He died in his sleep three days later. Sixty-seven-year-old John Spencer developed dyspnea, laboured breathing during the first day of the fog. He was dead in his chair within hours. A short time later, Spencer's wife was ill with pneumonia, a sickness doctors blamed on the shock of losing her husband. The notes about the victims seemed endless. The papers were typewritten, handwritten, and all very detailed. Each person had a medical history and a story about their death. But coroners still wouldn't connect the deaths with air pollution. Their naivete may seem stunning, but even doctors at the time didn't fully understand the risks of poor air quality. In the 1950s, public health statistics were only just starting to be retrievable for use in research. There were few computers in Britain, so data couldn't be calculated quickly. Finding a causative relationship between air pollution and elevated deaths would have been a daunting task. During the fog, Donald Acheson, like many other physicians, treated patients with a myriad of symptoms. Mucus hypersecretion was present in many victims, a telltale sign of asthma or cystic fibrosis. He assessed patients with heart problems. When patients were found dead or died in medical care, chief residents listed coronary heart disease, chronic bronchitis, or emphysema as cause of death on their death certificates. Acute respiratory failure due to smog would be the closest to the truth one would be likely to get, said Donald. But that phrase wasn't listed on any death certificates. Doctors would later discover that bronchitis was the most common cause of death during the fog. The number of its victims increased tenfold from the week before the fog until after it finally blew away. British doctors knew this fog had done something to their patients, but they couldn't yet make the connection. And now America was concerned. A United States government department, the Federal Security Agency, later renamed the Health Department, was conducting an international air pollution study. The chairman sent a confidential letter to Dr. Albert Parker, the director of fuel research at Britain's Department of Scientific and Industrial Research in London. In it, he referenced a newspaper report claiming the recent smog in England killed hundreds of people. It would be appreciated if you could supply us with information regarding these deaths and state whether they were attributed to the smog wrote George Clayton, a senior sanitation engineer. The Americans asked about the meteorological conditions, how long the event lasted, the causes of the deaths. The researchers also requested a map showing the areas where the dead people lived in relation to industry and other sources of pollution. The U.S. government was conducting an in-depth study along with the Canadian government. Researchers in both countries wanted details about the contaminants in the atmosphere. Because of the recent air pollution disasters, we are attempting to obtain as much information as possible on the subject in endeavouring to prevent a recurrence of such disasters, wrote Mr. Clayton. The United States was working towards stopping air pollution, and it needed Britain's help. The recent air pollution disasters included two deadly smog events, one in Europe and the other in America. The first was in December 1930 in the Meuse Valley in Belgium, one of the most industrialized areas of Europe at the time. For four days, an anticyclone like the one in London had trapped fog that combined with pollution from steel mills, coke ovens, foundries and smelters. It created a potion as deadly as gas used during warfare, killing more than 60 people and sickening thousands more. The day after the fog lifted, the Belgian government launched a judicial inquiry by appointing a committee which included experts in meteorology, toxicology, industrial chemistry, and pathology. The investigation led to the first scientific proof that air pollution caused death and disease. After the findings were released in 1931, an editorial in the British Medical Journal warned that the possibility of a similar incident happening in this country is a matter of great public health interest. 
The British government seemed to disregard the warning. The Meuse Valley smog happened more than 20 years before the 1952 London fog. The second smog incident happened during the week of October 26, 1948, when a heavy fog settled over Donora, Pennsylvania. The cool night air combined with the warm waters of the nearby Monongahela River. The fog mixed with the hydrogen fluoride emissions from a nearby zinc plant, along with sulfur dioxide from steel smelting plants owned by the U.S. Steel Corporation. Those toxins joined the smoke and fumes from thousands of domestic coal-burning furnaces. Donora's smog lasted five days. Residents panicked when the air began to make them ill, and town officials acted quickly. Oxygen tents cared for victims in the community centre, which was transformed into a hospital. A makeshift morgue was set up in the basement. Many people evacuated. Firefighters hauled heavy oxygen tanks to victims who couldn't leave their homes. Donora only had eight doctors, and they all raced from house to house, treating the sickest patients. The town hall became an emergency centre. Drivers left their cars behind. Those who tried to navigate the streets drove with their wheels scraping along the curbs. It was all an eerie foreshadowing of scenes in 1952 London. The thick yellowish fog killed twenty people in Donora and sickened thousands more. Nearly eight hundred animals died. Autopsies later revealed that the victims' fluorine levels were within lethal range. The smog would have likely killed thousands more if only the anticyclone had stayed longer. The Donora disaster was credited with triggering the clean air movement in the United States and introduced Americans to a relatively new word, smog. Victims hammered U.S. steel with lawsuits, and the American government immediately launched an inquiry. Investigators created a report, but researchers in the United States were still gathering information. The fog in London alarmed them. But in Britain, the Ministry of Health was in the middle of its own crisis. As officials recorded organized data from its medical officers, the Ministry also began soliciting information from the public. Ambulances were responding to an extra 100 calls a day, weeks after the fog lifted. Patients filled the hospitals, still choking, coughing and wheezing. How did they die? The Ministry of Health circulated a questionnaire called Fatalities Possibly Associated with Fog. They asked the families of victims of fog death to fill them out. Did the illness worsen during or after the fog? If so, what dates? How long bedridden before death? Do the relatives consider the fog contributed in any way to death? If so, how? The Ministry of Health began collecting their answers names, ages, prior health history, and symptoms. There was a troubling trend. Victims were suffering from vomiting, chronic chest trouble, headaches, delirium, exhaustion, chronic coughing, and even pain after drinking water, such cruel ordeals right before death. The Ministry of Health also compiled data about the levels and types of pollutants from the Director of Fuel Research. He listed 11 districts that reported back information on the levels of suspended matter in the air. The maximum fog density is not known for six of the above stations because the results were so high as to put the instruments off scale, noted the internal memo. The increase over normal was ten times or more. The levels were too high to calculate in some places. Health officials knew that immeasurable air pollution meant death for many Londoners. Just days earlier, more than eight million people were crammed into houses filled with smoke and fumes. There was no evidence of an influenza epidemic, so the excess deaths had to be blamed on the fog. And now the press was at last pursuing a promising story. Mass deaths perpetrated by a mysterious fog. The mystery fog illness newspaper stories were becoming problematic for the Ministry of Health. The rumour was now spreading to all media. Why did the fog make so many Londoners ill? Health officials had still refused to release any specific figures, and the Ministry of Health officials were forced to reply. It was unusually dense and long-lasting, and therefore unusually heavy in soot content 
which is harmful to the respiratory tract, said the Ministry of Health spokesperson in the New York Times. There was accompanying very cold weather, which increased the susceptibility of aged bronchitis sufferers and also increased coal burning in London. It was nasty, but not mysterious. A few days after that article was published, Labour MP Tom Dryberg asked Minister of Health Ian MacLeod to provide firm statistics about how many people had died in Greater London as a result of the fog. MacLeod said that not all of the figures were available, but he could say that more than 2,000 people had died during the week ending Saturday, December 6th, 519 more than during the same week last year. In two days, the fog had killed more than 500 people, an astounding number, and the Times included that data, though it appeared in a tiny summary on page 9. Newspapers and Labour MPs slowly pressed Winston Churchill's cabinet for more details, particularly the Minister of Health. The queries were all focused on Ian MacLeod because the number of deaths was so startling. The press was concerned with the effect of the fog, not the cause for now, so MacLeod would continue to squirm under questioning on his own. Then the government's own party began demanding answers. Tory MP Richard Fort, a former industrial chemist, and MP Herbert Williams, a conservative with a science and engineering degree, asked the Ministry of Health to provide updated death numbers. Ian MacLeod had to respond. The number of deaths from all causes in Greater London during the week ending 13th December was 4,703, compared with 1,852 in the corresponding week of 1951, he told Parliament. The cold weather had already caused some increase, but a large part of these increases must be attributed to the fog. There were 2,851 additional deaths. MPs were shocked, but there were even more disclosures. The Ministry of Health said that an informal inquiry of coroner's pathologists indicated that the increases in bodies varied from two to five times the expected number of autopsies. MacLeod said there would be an investigation which would include a study of lung chemistry in certain cases, an examination of pathology reports, and a chemical study of the fog and smoke. So far, informal reports from a variety of sources, suggest that the duration and density of the smoke-laden fog could largely explain the dramatic increase in deaths, he said. The next day, a Daily Mail headline proclaimed Fog Week Deaths Rose by 2,800. These numbers were startling, but they still caused no panic. The Manchester Guardian relegated that report to a brief of less than a hundred words in the middle of page 11. The world's biggest lead story was buried. A city hardened by war still believed the fog was simply a prolonged pea super, just another byproduct of living in London. A consensus was growing in Parliament. The Conservative government admitted that the fog had killed thousands of people, but despite a growing mound of evidence, lawmakers refused to blame pollution and coal for turning the clouds toxic. MP Norman Dodds listened patiently. He watched the debates for weeks. His constituents complained to him about the smoke and their illnesses. He was furious. It had burned his eyes, too, as he walked to Parliament on Monday and Tuesday. It seeped into his skin, made his path uncertain. He knew just how terribly the smog had affected the people he represented, and he knew the cause, coal. But no one in Parliament seemed to care. Norman needed a bit more evidence to prove the government was negligent, duplicitous even. But more than evidence, he needed allies. Those allies came from the National Smoke Abatement Society, the influential pressure group that had been fighting the government for decades. Founded in 1929, the NSAS was an independent coalition of politicians, medical officers, news reporters, sanitary inspectors, and other health professionals even some powerhouse attorneys. The society was funded through membership dues, donations, and for many years by the manufactured gas industry, which had a large stake in the decline of coal. The NSAS used its resources to order research, request documents, consult experts, 
and generally harass the government over air pollution. Its well-regarded quarterly subscription journal, Smokeless Air, was an annoyance to many conservative ministers. It was frequently circulated among MPs and then referenced during parliamentary debates. The National Society for Smoke Abatement was a reliable friend for clean air advocates like Norman and a vigorous opponent of Churchill's government. NSAS committee members demanded to see London's death records for the past century. As they examined them, they were stunned. The numbers confirmed what everyone had suspected. There had been a huge spike in deaths following the December 1952 smog. In fact, since they had started keeping records, only four other times had the numbers of deaths been higher than in the week following the recent fog. The jump in deaths was alarming. The committee went to the press and demanded the government launch an official investigation in view of the abnormal concentration of pollution in the atmosphere during the fog period and its exceptionally serious consequences. The group insisted on a government inquiry just like the one conducted in Donora, Pennsylvania four years earlier. The NSAS would be Norman Dodd's ally and he knew their main adversary would be Harold Macmillan, the Minister of Housing and Local Government. Air pollution fell under his purview, after all. Norman submitted a question to be read in front of everyone in the House of Commons. In view of the discomfort experienced by many millions of people, as well as animals in the recent foggy conditions, there is enough evidence to justify more energetic research into the harmful constituents of the air in towns. Norman asked what action the government would propose to reduce smog. Norman looked across the aisle at the Tories. Harold Macmillan was missing. In his place sat his junior minister, a bright but brash 45-year-old named Ernest Marples. When Winston Churchill had offered Macmillan the Ministry of Housing position a year earlier, Macmillan had been crestfallen. He had hoped to be appointed Minister of Defence. Housing just wasn't in his scope. On the whole, it seems impossible to refuse, Macmillan wrote in his diary in October 1951, but, oh dear, it is not my cup of tea. I really haven't a clue how to set about the job. Luckily, Macmillan knew how to select a strong team, like self-made businessman Marples, who often stepped in for him during sessions in Parliament. They were both incredibly wealthy men, yet their styles were different, so complementary. Macmillan was measured, efficient, but lacked spark. Marples exuded confidence and radiated passion, but needed to be toned down at times. Today, however, the junior minister was appropriately docile as he dismissed Norman Dodds and his pointed question. Arrangements have already been made to encourage the use of improved types of domestic appliances designed to burn smokeless fuel, replied Marples glibly. But the appliances weren't the problem. There wasn't enough smokeless fuel to burn in them, something the government refused to admit. The country was yoked to coal, and not just any coal. The British were dependent on the cheap, polluting, nutty slack coal dust. In fact, in December 1952, the government was still enthusiastically promoting it, despite the horrible smog. Norman was livid. The deadly fog would be his next crusade, and he would need America's help. But soon there would be another story that would draw the media's attention away from the drab details of a London fog. It was much more salacious, a disgusting, revolting criminal who would soon sell millions of newspapers. The weather was wintry on Sunday, December 14th. A thin layer of sleet covered the ground. The Christie's lay in bed early that morning, around 8.15. The house at 10 Rillington Place was quiet, almost peaceful for once. The fog had disappeared just four days earlier. The carpet of grey smoke no longer cloaked those secrets in the garden. Reg glanced at his wife. She was so tranquil, lying still. Her face was pale. A stocking was tied around her neck, leaving deep indentations beneath it. There was a makeshift diaper beneath her, between her legs. He was alone. Finally, the house was his. He could leave and return, whenever it suited him with no explanation, bring anyone around he liked. 
But now his mind was so muddled. He needed to hide her, but he couldn't concentrate. It seemed too hard to figure out. He left her in bed for two or three days, but he couldn't bear sleeping next to her. He laid down some blankets and slept on the floor. His mind wasn't working right. He didn't know where to keep her. Then I remembered some loose floorboards in the front room, he recalled. I had to move a table and some chairs to roll the lino back about halfway. There were deep depressions under the floor of the Christie's parlour, just enough space to store a body. He returned to Ethel, now rigid in their bed, and tried to move her. This would be a cumbersome chore. At just under five foot four, Ethel wasn't tall, but she was heavy, and Reggie's back still wasn't right. He tried to carry her, but she was too bulky. He placed a pillowcase over her head and slipped her gold wedding ring off her finger. Then Reg picked up a pair of scissors and looked down at her. He snipped off some of her pubic hairs, caught them in his fingers, and put them aside, a final keepsake from his wife. He wrapped a flowered cotton dress around her and a silk dress over that, then slowly rolled her in a flannelette blanket. I had to sort of half carry her and half drag her and put her in that depression and cover her up with earth, recalled Reg. I thought that was the best way to lay her to rest. He replaced the flooring, moved back the table and chair, and now he plotted. The next day Reg picked up the writing tablet, the one Ethel had used to write a letter to her sister Lily five days earlier. Her note, perfectly composed, was still there. He glanced at the date, December 10th, 1952. He took a pen, black with a thin point, and carefully placed two small marks at the top of the zero, one horizontal and one vertical. December 15th, 1952, it now read. The woman Lying beneath her own parlour floor was alive, as far as her sister would believe, but he thought his sister-in-law might need more convincing. Reg included a small note written in the upper left-hand corner of his wife's letter. Ethel had no envelopes, so I posted this for her from work. Reg. He mailed it that day. Ethel's family might leave him alone now, at least for a while, but his wife honoured little customs, especially around the holidays. He needed to give those some attention. Dear Lil, Ethel has got me to write her cards for her, as her rheumatism in her fingers is not so good just now, Reg wrote. Doctor says it's the weather, and she will be okay in two or three days. I am rubbing them for her. As soon as Ethel can write, perhaps by Saturday, she's going to send a letter. Hope you like the present she selected for you, Reg. A disgusting lie. He gathered together the parcel, placing the stationery inside. At the top of his letter, he included a note meant to be comforting, even underlining the first line. Don't worry, she is okay. I shall cook Christmas dinner. Reg. He filled out a Christmas card addressed to Ethel's brother, Harry Waddington, in Sheffield. It was a scene from a Victorian winter. A woman in a flowing dress and bonnet holds the arm of a man in dress tails and a top hat, as they walk along the road of a picturesque town. Christmas greetings, with all kind wishes for the best of health and good luck, it said. At the bottom of the card he wrote, From Ethel and Reg. There were so many things to do. Ethel's murder was a new impulse for Reg, with a different motive from the killings before. He had murdered the other women because he wanted them to comply. He had charmed them, raped them, and then killed them. But his wife's murder was so different. He didn't poison her with coal gas. He didn't rape her. But he did strangle her. And Ethel wasn't unconscious. The abrasions on her neck showed she was strangled from the front. Ethel Christie, eyes wide open, watched her husband of more than thirty years as he twisted and squeezed the stocking tighter. Then he killed her. After she had gone, Reg would later say, the way was clear for me to fulfill my destiny.'